thank you for the greatest and most amazing gift that you've given us, and that's your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. Jesus, we thank you for you are that holy lamb who came and died for us. You were slain for us, as we sang in the last song. We thank you for being willing and joyous to offer yourself as a sacrifice and to die even the most shameful death in order to save us. And so we pray, Lord, that your grace toward us would not be in vain, but that we would labor more than all, as Paul said. We pray, O Holy Spirit, that you would come and do a work in our midst, that you would move between our rows, that you would minister to our hearts, that you would use the living word to pierce our hearts and to convict us and to change us and to mold us and to take out all the all the things that are impure and to purify us with your holy fire. We pray for a word from you. We don't want to hear earthly wisdom. We don't want to hear a lecture. But we desire to hear your word, not emotions, not philosophy, not eloquence. But we, hear, we desire to hear you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Philippians 2. Last week we studied verses uh, 3 and 4. Tonight we will start with verse 5. I'd like to do a quick review. Uh, so Philippians 1 deals with when we have problems in our life, the solution is... You guys can't be asleep already. I just started. <laughs> huh? All right. So one word I'm looking for. Thank you. Perfect. You guys are excellent. I didn't even have to repeat it. That's awesome. So Christ is the solution to our problems, our issues, our difficult situations. Now, when it comes to difficult issues between us and each other as believers, what's the solution? Huh? No, but it's nice. What did you say? She said Christ. That's for the solution to our problems, but to each other. Sure, Christ, but how? Love, good. So, but that leads us consolation, good. Unity, thank you. So that's others, Make, meaning we think of others rather than ourselves. Good, you guys are awesome. You guys rock. All right, so... <laughs> So that's what Paul starts out with. Verse 1, he says, since you have these four amazing things, then, therefore, verse 2, he says, I want you to do these four things, these other four things. And he kind of combines them. Since you're equipped and you're empowered by these four things, by being a Christian, if you're a true believer, not Christian by name, not one who attends church, but a true changed person, true person who, is, who knows for sure, has assurance, if they die right now, they're going to heaven. Since you have these four things, use them and now apply them in these four different ways. And I'm not going to talk about them because we spent uh, two weeks ago on it. Apply these four things. And if you apply these four things, you're going to make me, Paul, so happy. Now here is the thing. Imagine, now I know that I can speak with boldness that not a person in this room at this time, other than myself, has, I think, has any children. So... Now imagine this. Imagine every one of you is a parent right now. And imagine you don't have a child, but you've got at least two children. How would you feel? How would you feel if all that happened at home is, you know, fighting back and forth between your, your children? How would you like that household? Would you enjoy it? No, that's not good, right? You, you know, there's a, a thing that my wife showed me a while ago. She says, if you have one child, you're a something. I don't remember. But the one I remember is if you have two, because I have two. So that one stuck with me. This was over a year ago that she showed me this. If you have two kids, you're a referee as a parent. You're just like trying to like be a referee between these two kids. And it's very true. And then if you have three, and then if you have four, it kept going, like each one. And it sounded worse. So I was like, let's stop it too, you know. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> referee's fine. <laughs> but um, it's hard. You know, I remember. I go back to the days of, of my teenage years. 
Back in the days when I used to be strong, I used to be stronger than my brother, my little brother. <laughs> I know you don't believe it, but I really used to be stronger than him one day. And then, you know, we used to fight all the time, and that's because, you know, I was stronger. I stopped, I stopped fighting the day he became stronger than me. I said, hey, brother, I accepted Christ in my heart. We shouldn't fight anymore. <laughs> Praise the Lord for the reverence God gave me in his eyes because he can crush me. But we used to fight all the time, and my poor parents, our poor parents, they would just be so frustrated. Like, you know, if you go visit our house, Oh, whew, I thought he was walking in right now. If you go to our house, he, uh, you know, there's holes in the wall from us. You know, just like these big monsters, like, blah, you know, all this going through the walls, punching and wrestling. And, and we used to be like into weightlifting and stuff, and it was just crazy. And so I don't know what this guy thing, I don't get it. I don't do that stuff anymore. I don't, I don't get it. But anyways, but it was really bothersome. Same thing, you know, can you imagine God? It's really annoying when, when you find your kids fighting all the time. It's not just annoying. It breaks the parents' heart. When I see my kids fighting and about silly things and all the time, it breaks my heart. But I, that's nothing. I got two kids. But how many kids, I'm talking about true Christians, does God have? And is he seeing at all times and all the contentions we have that's going before him? Man, how his heart must be broken. And so that's why Paul says, you guys are my children. To Paul, it would make me so happy if you guys could just stop fighting with each other as Christians. It would make me so happy if you can have unity with each other. And if it would make Paul happy, how much more do you think it would make the Father's heart happy? And I really pray that we pay attention to chapter 2. Chapter 1 is important because we focus on Christ for our problems. And I hope we make him number one. But I hope we'll go from there and let that lead us into number two where we put each other before each other. Where I no longer think of myself, but I think of the other Christians as more important than myself. Then he came in verse three and four, which is what we studied last week. And he said, hey guys, I'll tell you the secret of why we fight a lot. And he says, it's two things is our problem. And that's uh, selfish ambition or conceit. And then he says, I'll also tell you what the solution is. The solution is humility. And to be lowly, to have lowliness of, of mind. That's the solution to our problem. And he says in, in verse 3, I just want to start out with this question. Is, well, first question is, are we breaking? Am I? Am I? Me personally. Not the next person. No, me personally. Am I breaking God's heart or not? Am I breaking those who are leaders above me that God has put over me? Am I breaking their heart? Am I breaking mainly, no, forget them, mainly God's heart by being contentious and having all these fights and quarrels and backbiting and talking and, uh, you know, and, and, and maybe uh, gossiping and whatever it is that I'm doing, talking bad about other believers or not? And if I am, it's time that I stop becoming part of the problem and I start becoming part of the solution. It's time that I say, Lord, enough is enough. I don't want to break your heart because that is important to me. Lord, I don't want to be a problem child. I want to be a child that you are satisfied with, that you are pleased when you look at me, that you smile, that I bring you a smile rather than a heartache because of me continuing to fight and fight and fight on all I think about. Is me. The second question is, it says in verse 3, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. Conceit means pride. Selfish ambition meaning I'm number one. Everything is going to happen as long as in my way, no matter what the cost is. And he says, let nothing be done that way. So the second thing that is really important, when I am about to do something, when I'm about to think of an idea, when I'm about to propose an idea, when I'm about to do an action, do I let it pass through a checkpoint or do I just do it? Do I let it be tested or not? Do I put it through the real x-ray of is this considered selfish ambition or not? And if it is, it doesn't go past. It says it's like, you know, imagine you go over to uh, uh, the airport and let's say you want to be funny. Don't do it. And you decide to take a toy gun and put it in your check-on bag. Okay, don't do it. Juan David, you're traveling, don't do it. You will not go see your dad, man. So you put this toy gun in there, and they're going to go like that, 
And then guess what's going to happen? It's going to go back and forth, back and forth. And they'll be like, step aside, son. Come with me. You know, when, back when the Bin Laden thing happened, 9-11, you know, I have a terroristic look to me, you know, being Arab and all. <laughs> so I used to be randomly chosen all the time, and I did not hold any grudge to be checked for bombs. <laughs> they, stick, they take this little cloth thing, and then they go like that to my bag, and then somehow they say, oh, you don't have a bomb on you. I don't know how the little cloth can do it, but whatever. And so, but I, I didn't, I was, I actually felt safe. I'm like, you know, I look like a terrorist. You know, you should check me double, tri triple, and four times. And so, the, <laughs> why was I saying that? <laughs> now I'm, this cold is, let nothing, huh? Thank you, Michael, you're so kind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition and we should, we should let everything be done at the checkpoint. That's why I was saying it. Checkpoint. We should check it. We should say, you know, this, this is a danger. This is a problem. This is an issue. We should stop it, and it doesn't go further. We arrest it and take it from there. Do you and I do that or not? Or is it always about me? Is it always about I need to be happy? I need to find myself. That's what the world tells us. That's what they tell you out there. You know, the, I told you guys this thing that... <sighs> There was this lady, she goes on Oprah. Her name is Iyama or something like that. And this lady, one time, this guy calls her and says, hey, you know, I am gay, but my parents are Christian and I don't know how to tell them. And I don't know what to do. She's like, and, and he's like, you know, in the Bible, it says that that's wrong. She says, baby, <laughs> the Bible says, honor thyself. Baby, the Bible says, be true to thyself. I'm like, what Bible is this crazy lady talking about? That's not in the Bible. And then the people in the crowd, yeah, amen, sister. <laughs> and they're going like... That's not, that's not what it's about. That's what people teach. And they, they, they think that they say the word thy, that means it's in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. This is crazy stuff, guys. I really pray that we get away from that, this myself thing, that thyself, that I have to, to be happy. It's about me. You know, if it makes me happy, I'm going to do it. That's a road toward disaster. That's a, word, that's, that's a way as far away from God as possible. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. Everything needs to stop there. Everything needs to pause there and be x-rayed, be imaged by God, and look and be taken under God's standard and say, is this selfish or not? If it is, it's gone. Is this my pride or not? And if it is, it's gone. I don't do this anymore. That is very, very important. So first is, am I pleasing God or not in my life? Or am I breaking His heart through my relationship with others, with all these fights and issues and talking back and the cold war we have with each other? Second question is, when I am going to do something or think of something or bring up something to where it's in the public, an idea or whatever, is it selfish? If it is, it should never cross my mind. That's it. It stops there. If it's conceited, it should stop there. If it's about me, it should stop there and not go any further. The next question that comes, or the next thing that's very important in the test is, okay, so it's not selfish ambition, it's not conceited. The next question is, is it lowly? Is it humility? Is it humble? Is it putting others before me? Or is it thinking about me before others? Is it honoring others or is it honoring me? And that's what it says in the, the latter part of verse 3. It says, But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Meaning, I look at you as, as a believer as being your needs are more important than mine. Let each of you look not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And I really pray that we pause at this every time we do anything. We do anything, first, is we, first I need to evaluate how is my relationship with believers. If it's bad, I need to say, Lord, I'm a problem child. I'm just not going to water it. I'm going to tell you the truth. 
Do I need help? I need help. And I need you, Lord, to let me put things through that checkpoint, and I need you to help me with that. The checkpoint of selfish ambition and conceit of everything I do, and take that away from me. And then let me put it through that real checkpoint of lowliness where I'm esteeming others better than me. I think of others more than I think of myself. Then, Lord, that's going to fix my relationship with others. Tonight, verse 5, <clears throat> he says, you know, now, now Christ talked to us about his heart and what he really wants of us and as we deal with each other. Then he says, in order for me to do that, now I want to give you an example to demonstrate, to give you a picture so you could look at this picture and realize, ah, that's what it means to be lowly. That's what it means to have lowliness of mind. Verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Man, <laughs> you're going to start deep. It's crazy. He says, let this mind be in you. This mind means let this attitude be in you. Because if your attitude is going to determine how you act and do things. Can you imagine like this? You know, if so, if you, do you guys know anyone? Don't raise your hand. Do you know anyone who has a bad attitude? Be like, do I know anyone? I know too many people that have bad attitudes. All of us will say, well, do you have a bad attitude? I hope not. But people with bad attitude, what do they do? If they go with that bad attitude at home, oh, brother. You're like, oh, man, let's avoid them. You know, the family's like, you go to that bad attitude to work, not a good production day for whatever job you do. You go with that bad attitude to church, you, you know, you just, it's not good. But you go with a good attitude, even if things, bad things are happening, you're already, your outlook is good. So it starts to, you, you still, you absorb it better. You absorb bad news, you absorb difficulties and things better with that attitude. So he says, I want you to have this attitude. Which attitude? Not your attitude, not my attitude. He says, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. I want your mind to think like Jesus. I want your attitude to be like the attitude of Jesus. Wow. How's your mind? How's my mind? How's our attitude? Is it the attitude of Jesus or is it my attitude? He says, do you want to have a good relationship with others? Go to Christ. Look at him. He's the first example of loneliness. He gives us more than one example of loneliness in this chapter. But he first starts with the ultimate. He first starts with Christ. How is our attitude? Is it the attitude of Christ when, when, when we are faced with a situation? You know, how many of us, don't raise your hand, but how many of us had some bad news today? Or something bad happened today. I'm sure, you know, probably if I ask people to raise their hand, it'll be like 100%, you know, like, yeah, man. And then it'll be like, talk about it. It'll be like, we wouldn't be done, you know. <laughs> but the thing is, that bad thing that happened to you, imagine it happening to Christ in your circumstances. The way you reacted, is that the same way Christ would have? And it'd be like, well, actually, it's kind of far from it then that's not what we're practicing here. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Have I let him down today in the way I react, in my attitude? You know, did I go today to work with a bad attitude because someone treated me wrong? Because my boss was unfair. Because, you know, my professor or my teacher was treating me bad. Or because I feel that this is unfair. Or because, you know, at home someone, you know, you know, my dad, my mom, my brother, my sister, someone did something bad to me. Or whatever. You know, did I, was my attitude a Christ attitude today or not? And if it wasn't, he says, let this attitude, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, in attitude, in reaction, in everything. He says, but I also want to take you to exactly what I'm talking about in Christ, because we're talking about relationship with each other, and it's talking about the true way to solve it is with lowliness. And I want to talk, tell you about real lowliness, real humility. Look at Christ. Do you want to be floored? Look at Jesus Christ. I'm floored when I look at Jesus, when I really, like, if I can just... 
Like the, the days when it just hits me for real, like what exactly happened? I'm just like, amazing, unbelievable what happened. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Okay, let me take you back to eternity past. Who? Being, so here's the attitude now, he's given it to us in detail, multiple areas, multiple things about it. Who being in the form of God. The word form here is not like a shape or size. And is not a creature, creation, none of that. It's an expression that's used to, to tell us an outward expression of an inward nature. Being in the form of God, he's saying that Jesus Christ is God. Okay? Who being, I'll kind of go through quickly what it means, and then we'll, we need to pause a little bit on the deity of Christ, okay? Because that's a big issue for if you deal with some people out there, some of the cults out there. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, meaning he is God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God or something to be held on to to be equal with God. Meaning he's saying that he is God. He didn't, it's not like he's ripping him off. He's not by saying, hey, I'm God. He's going to God the Father saying, aha, I ripped you off. I tricked him. No, he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. He didn't consider it something to be equal with God. That's a known thing. He is equal with God. What's he trying to tell us here? He says, have this mind in you. He taught, he's telling us the word is others. Think of others. So he is God. And he became what? Man. Is that a demotion? Or is that a promotion? God to man. Would you do it? No way, man. That's a big time demotion. Okay, let me let me let me throw it at you this way. All right. Imagine. So I'll tell you guys a joke, which I'm sure you guys have heard it in many different ways. There's three people who are on this island, stranded. They happen to find this lamp. And all three of them grab the lamp at the same time. And as they grab the lamp, this genie comes out. So guess what? All three of them rub the lamp at the same time. He says, there's three wishes, but unfortunately, it's three of you guys, so one wish per person. So, and yes, he said, you can't ask for more wishes as one of your wish, all right? Because I would ask for unlimited wishes. That would be my first wish. But he knows, you know, he knows us, how we play. So, Jenny comes out, asks the first guy, hey, what do you want? He says, ah, Hawaii. Poof, the guy's in Hawaii. He asks the second guy, what do you want? I want to be rich, as rich as can be, the richest man alive. Poof. He goes to, and he wants to be in that, land, you know, in his hometown, rich. So he goes, Poof. he's in his hometown. The third guy says, I'm lonely, I want them back here. Poof. Now they're back, they ran out. <laughs> they ran out of wishes, wow. Anyways, now imagine you're the genie, but you don't have chains, you're not stuck in a lamp, but you have the power of a genie. And you could do anything you want. That's pretty powerful, pretty amazing. You could be anywhere, anytime like that. It takes you a second. You can make anything you want, create anything you want. Now imagine you are God. You're not a genie. No limits. It's not you can be anywhere you want. You are everywhere at the same time. You're all-knowing, all-powerful. All, 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 everything. And then you say, hmm, there's these people on earth. And these people are perishing. They're going to go into eternal condemnation because of sin. There's no way which is what Job, I was reading this actually in my reading, daily reading last night, in Job 9, he says, Lord, who can 
I need help. Who can, who, can, who can reconcile me to you? If only, and he made this wish, and he didn't know that he was wishing for salvation. If only someone can put his hand on you and on me and reconcile us. But who can? Because see, the problem is if a human touches Job, no problem. He touches God, he's consumed. The solution is there has to be someone who's 100% God, 100% man, who can touch both, not be consumed by God, and not consume man at the same time and reconcile, and that's Jesus Christ. But see, imagine you're God. You own everything. You rule everything. You created everything. You hold everything by your hand. You have all this power. Would you say, okay, I'm going to come down to earth and be human and die? Would you do it? No way. Would you come down here and have these measly little creatures whom you've created spit at you? Did they spit at Jesus? Yeah. Slap you? Scourge you? Crucify you? You are God. You're not a genie. You're not some imaginary tale. You are God. Would you do it? I wouldn't. I'd be like, forget these people, wipe them out, make new ones that act like robots to believe in me. Let's not forget the line of thought here. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then he takes us to eternity past, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. And he came here. Are you floored? I am speechless. What an amazing God. Why would he do this? He says, see, I don't want to talk to you about humility. I want to show you humility. And the only reason that I have this humility, it could only be done by one thing. And that is because I really love you. If I didn't love you, I wouldn't do it. That's why it doesn't, never tells us in the Bible that God told us about his love. But it says God demonstrated his love. While we were, in Romans 5, right? Romans 5, 8. While we were yet sinners, he came and died for us. Let me read it exactly. I think that's the verse. <clears throat> but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. It's amazing. And he's asking you and me to have this mind, this attitude toward each other. It's not about me. I'm not no longer number one. But I should look at you as a believer as being number one. Do you think we would have issues and problems with each other if we really have this mind of Christ? I think it would be pretty impossible. It would be, be weird. It would be crazy. How would that happen? Be like, hey, man, he said this about you. Well, he's more important. She, she's more important. We wouldn't believe any of this junk that's coming. I want to talk about the deity of Christ for a minute. John chapter 1. The Gospel of John, chapter 1. Verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. Who's the Word? Jesus Christ, right? And He's God. Now, in the beginning was the Word. Here He's just in the beginning. We'll take it step by step. In the beginning was the Word. So, in the beginning, when you go back there, is that when the Word came to be? Huh? Before, right? So, is there a beginning to him? Because in the beginning, here's it, let me read it to you two different ways. In the beginning is the word. In the beginning was the word. Is there a difference? Yes. Or in the beginning became the word, and in the beginning was the word. Meaning in the beginning, go back to the beginning, wherever that is, and good luck, was the word. He's already been there. He's already existed. He's eternal. Past. You can't find the beginning to him. 
In the beginning was the Word. This is talking about the deity of Christ. It's huge. And the Word was with God. Meaning here, he's telling us something very important about with God. That Jesus Christ was with God. That means, is he the same exact thing as the Father or not? No, he's not. He's his own person. He's, there's a trinity. This is very difficult. Very, it's hard to get in our head. But, and if you get to Muslims, and this is the new trick of Muslims nowadays, they'll, tell, they'll try to throw anything, go around the circle, and then throw it. Say, Explain to me the eternity. And then they'll run away. They don't even want to listen to you. And then we'll all start stumbling and tripping on our own self. And so, because it's hard to, to understand. So, here it's telling us that he's eternal. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. That he is his own Godhead. Trinity. The first person, the second person, the third person. These are just terminology that we make. It's not biblical terminology. Was with God. So, he has his own personality, his own function, his own everything. And the Word was God. And here he tells you his deity. Him and the Father are equal. Very important. Very important. If you talk to Muslims, take them to John chapter 1. He was in the beginning with God. In the beginning. Go back there. He was with God. Tells us that, that, that there's, he's, he's different in personality, in, 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 in person, in function, and all this stuff. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Who's the creator? Who is he? Which God, when you say God? He's only one God, but which one of the Godhead? Okay. Let me read it again. In the beginning, who, is, who are we talking about here in John 1, 1? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So who's He? Jesus. All things were made through Him. And without Him, nothing was made that was made. Who? Jesus. So who's the Creator? Jesus. In Him was life. And here there's two types of life. There's physical life and spiritual life. So as believers, we receive two life from Jesus Christ. Sinners, they only received one life, physical life. But there's eternal life that we get. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And this life that he has, he's the one that, he has this light. And in this light, he guides everyone. And that's why when everyone dies, or he comes, no one, every mouth will be stopped, it says. No one will say, but I do. there's no ifs, ands, or buts. Everyone can be like, you know what, you gave me a fair chance. The pastor was talking about it last night. There's not a person that's going to go to hell and be like, not fair. No, it's too harsh. Everyone will be like, that's my place. Colossians 1. Verse 15. Colossians 1, 15. About Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God. He's the image of the invisible God. Is God the Father visible or invisible? Invisible. Why? He's a spirit. Exactly. So if you want to see God the Father, who do you have to look to? Jesus. Exactly. He is the image of the invisible God. He's saying he is God. You want to look at a representative of God? Look at Jesus. You want to look at who God is, God's heart? Look at Jesus. Isn't that what happened in John, I believe, 14, 9? I hope I'm right. John 14, verse 9. Philip in verse 8 said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is sufficient for us. Ah, oh, if I could just see the Father. Wow, that would be awesome. That's all I need. <laughs> just show me the Father. I'm done. You can take me. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? <laughs> he answered as if he's the Father, meaning, uh, hello, look at me. Hello, I am God. I am the image of the invisible God. 
Back to Colossians 1.15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Firstborn over all creation is a figurative speech, and it's saying that he's the top. He's everything. He's the creator. He's the supreme being. Now, let's go to Hebrews. We'll end with this one about the deity of Christ. Hebrews 1. Hebrews 1 and <clears throat> verse 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. He says, God spoke to us through many, 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 many prophets in the past in different ways, in different forms, and different things. Has in these last days spoken to us by his son. Then he wanted to do a finale, a grand finale, and that grand finale is his son. Whom he has appointed heir of all things. His son is, owns everything. Everything is his. That's why every knee will bow or not. Yes, willingly or not. They will be willing at that time, at the end time. No, one, no knee is not going to be unwilling. No one's going to be like, ah, force me to do it. They're going to do it. Every knee will bow. Through whom also he made the worlds. So the Father made, created everything through who? Jesus. And that's what we just said in John 1, right? Who being the brightness of his glory. So you want to see the brightness of the Father's glory? Look at who? Jesus. Is he God or not? He's God. The brightness of his glory. And what? Look at this one. And the express image of his person. You want to see the Father express image as you can, like that perfect. Look at who? Jesus. He's God. These people that say Jesus is not God, they're crazy. There's so many evidence, so much evidence. I'm not even, I'm only going through three, three passages or four. The express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. Everything, he created it, right? But now everything has to hold in place or moving, but has to be held together and not collapse, not... You know who's holding it? Jesus. You know, scientists ask them, hey, what holds atoms together? They're like, we don't know. That would be awesome to figure it out. <laughs> Jesus is. You know what this means, guys? This really, like, is amazing. Jesus holds everything in his hand. You know, in my, in my field, I see all kind of crazy stuff. I see young people, very healthy, without any issues, poof, drop dead. I see people that look so old with all kind of medical problems that they look like they're the walking. I've had one time one person saw one of my patients. They're like, how is this person alive? And I said, I have no idea. I don't know. What are you doing? I'm like, I'm not doing anything. That's God, holds everything in his hand. There's nothing. One doctor once was saying this, and I was like, this guy has no idea. He says, I can make anyone live as long as I want. <laughs> He's an intensivist, so he puts people on machines and stuff. And I was like, no, you can't. Well, I didn't say that, but in my heart, I said it. So I was like, it's not about it. It's not a good time to fight. <laughs> That's so untrue. You can put all the machines, all the pressers, all the everything. When God shuts it, he shuts it. This makes me realize like, Lord, wow, I'm so small. Yet you look at me and you see me something so big in your eyes. I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about as, as people, as believers. And yet with my arrogance, many times I live as I have no God. I just do whatever, sin if I will, do this, and he'll forgive me. And I don't realize that you hold everything in your hand. All you got to do is just a little, and it's done. I could be done in a second. I could be done at age, you know, 37, like that. Seen people die at 33 of nothing, just pain, boom, dead. 
of what? Do they have conditions? Nope, no problem. No medical problems. Just did, were they exercising or anything? No, just drop dead. Nothing. Sitting there, drop dead. Wow. Makes me feel like, wow, Jesus, you are Lord. You are all knowing. You are sovereign. You're amazing. And you hold everything. And yet you find me precious in your eyes. Lord, let me not push it too far. Lord, let me love you with a sincere heart because even though you're so powerful, yet you see me so special in your eyes. <sighs> Holding, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And it's amazing. He created everything by what? A word. Let there be, let there be, let there be. But when it came to sin, he didn't say, let there be. But he says, this one can't be done by the power of my word. But I have to think of others. I have to come down to earth. I have to, me who knows no sin, become sin. Not sinful, but become sin to save those who are sinners. You know, if we compare, I'm going to go real quickly, just maybe three minutes. I want to compare Satan and Adam. And their opposite attitude compared to the attitude of Christ. And I want to I end with a question is, where are you and I? Do we have the mind, the attitude of Christ? Do we think like he does or are we more like Satan and Adam? In um, Isaiah 14, Isaiah chapter 14, this guy likened it to that and I really liked it. And verse 12, it's talking about Satan here. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. Exclamation mark. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. You're so strong. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. Satan said, I will. And what did Jesus say? He said to the Father, your will. It's a di totally different attitude, totally different <laughs> Totally different way of addressing things. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I'm going to be better than everything else. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I'm going to be as high as can be. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Here he's saying, I want to be a creator and Christ says, I'm the creator, but I want to come and save you. You, yet you shall be brought down to Sheol. That's what God's command and this God's decision. To the lowest depths of the pit. Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28. Again about Satan. So it's pride. It's the, it's the same thing that we talked about. It says selfish ambition and conceit, right? That's exactly what it's, it's the right thing. Uh, Ezekiel 28, verse uh, 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre. You need to cry for the king of Tyre. King of Tyre here represents Satan. And say to him, thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection. Man, you were amazing when I created you. Full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You don't get any more beautiful than the way you were. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. Imagine that's what your covering is, okay, ladies? All right, listen up. The, the sardius, topaz, and diamond. Oh, diamond. Be <laughs> I'm kidding. Beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. Woo! The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. 
just you don't get more beautiful than the way you were. You were the anointed cherub who covers. Just like you don't get better than that. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. Amazing creature. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. But something happened till iniquity was found in you. What is it? Pride. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within. And you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub. From the midst of the fiery stones, your heart was lifted up. You became arrogant. You became prideful. Because of your iniquity, because of your beauty, you said, oh, you're so beautiful. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth. In the sight of all who saw you, all who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. Everyone's like, whoa, what happened? You were so amazing. Look at how down you are. You were so perfect. Look at what happened. You were so beautiful. Look at what happened. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. Genesis chapter 1. This is the state that God had Adam and Eve in. And verse 26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Who's king of the world? No, right now. Who's king over everything? Adam, he has dominion over everything, right? Dominion over everything. Chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And here he started to put his poison. And the woman said to the serpent, here he's trying to make her doubt the goodness of God. We may eat, and I don't have time to meditate on this, the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And here he's saying, here she added, here she, now she's starting to look at God that he's mean. She, he never said, you can't touch it. You can touch it, you can play basketball with it, you can play soccer with it if you want. You can do whatever you want, you just can't eat it. And here he's just saying, even if we touch it, he's going to kill us. Look how mean God is. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. He's a liar. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You have power, but it's not enough. You have dominion over everything, but you need to have more. You need to be like him. That's the exact thing that made Satan fall. He played the trick on who? Adam and Eve. So when the woman saw here what is called selfish ambition and conceit, the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. She says, forget everything, God. I want to be like God. I want to be powerful. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Back to our chapter. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Whose mind, whose attitude do you and I have? We saw specifically about Jesus that it's not even, you couldn't even call it a demotion. It's worse than anything. I like the way Easy likens it. He says, imagine if you were to become an ant to save the ants. Would you do it? That would be a big time demotion. But you know what? He says that's not even close to what God did. It's not a human becoming an ant. But it's God becoming a human. The creator becoming in the image of a creature. He's not created. Be careful how you say these things. The creator came in the image 
of the creature. He did not consider it robbery, but in all of this, he didn't think of himself. But like the song says, you thought of us before the world began. Whose mind, whose attitude do you and I have? It's one of two. It's either we're like Satan and Adam. It's the same issue, the same sin. Just one is blatant and the other is more subtle. But it's the same thing. It's selfish ambition and conceit. Or is it the mind of Christ, lowliness? I really pray that, you know, we come before God honestly and sit before him for a minute and say, Lord, where am I? Where am I? How is my relationship with others? That's a good way to measure it. If all I'm doing is I have so many believer friends, believers, true believers, that all I have is issues with them, fights with them, then maybe, maybe I'm not having the mind of Christ. If all I have is in everyone in church that's a believer, I have an issue with. I have a complaint about them. <coughs> I look at them like that then maybe I don't have the mind of Christ. Or do I look at others and I look at them as more important than me? Do I look at others and look at them and I esteem them more important, put their needs more important than mine? Then maybe I have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ, first of all, it says, think of others and not yourself. Humble yourself. Bring yourself down. Christ humbled himself from God coming to man. You and I, no matter how much we humble ourselves, it's not close to what Christ did. But he wants us to have that attitude toward each other as we deal with each other. I really would like us as we pray to just ask ourselves this question, where am I tonight? What mind do I have? What attitude do I have? Who has been hovering in my brain? Has it been, have I been under the influence of Satan lately? Or have I been under the influence of Christ? Does he have the preeminence? Do I look at my brothers and sisters with the eyes of Christ as people who are precious that were saved by him? That he loved enough to die for them? And that I would have that same mind, that same attitude? Father, we thank you for your word. And oh, how we thank you for the example of Jesus Christ. And oh, Jesus, how you are God. And you didn't consider it something to be held on to, yet you thought of us. And you left everything to come here. Lord, we confess that many times we just are all about ourselves, we're so self-involved, we so are so self-absorbed. And many times, Lord, we rarely think of each other or even think of you, Lord. So we come, Lord, and we say we're sorry. We seek forgiveness and we seek your heart. We seek your heart as we deal with each other, that you would give us this love, this unity, that we put each other above ourselves and more important, I mean, esteem each other more important than ourselves. Lord, give us your attitude, give us your heart, give us your mind. Let us act and react in a way that pleases you. Lord, we pray that you would bring fruit from these words in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.